Okay, it's about around half seven, so we're going to uh, begin. Uh, let me just say on behalf of UCCF, who are sponsoring the debate this evening, I uh, give you a very warm welcome. Uh, let me offer at the outset my thanks to those who are involved in, in this evening, to those who are debating, to Dr. James Crossley, uh, Professor William Lane Craig, and also to Professor Hugh Piper, who's kindly agreed to act as moderator this evening. The format of the debate will be as follows. There will be 20 minute opening presentations, 12 minute first rebuttals, eight minute second rebuttals, and five minute closing statements. After the speaker's closing statements, there will be an opportunity for questions from the floor. Questions will be asked to each speaker in turn. Finally, if I could ask you to leave any applause until after the speaker's closing statements and after the question and answers, this will again allow us to fit in as much as possible and to finish by 9.30 p.m. I'd now like to hand over to Professor Piper. Thank you and welcome. It's my happy duty to introduce to you the two speakers tonight, our two doughty debaters. But I do just want to say welcome to all of you and remind you what an important part you have in this proceedings. Good argument is listened out of people by good and critical attention. And that is what you can bring to heighten the quality of what we're looking forward to as a really good and enjoyable debate. But now to introduce our speakers. Professor William Lane Craig, who we're very glad to welcome to Sheffield, is Research Professor of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He earned a doctorate in philosophy at the University of Birmingham and took a doctorate in theology from the University of Munich. Dr. Craig's lectured and written widely. He's authored or edited over 30 books, including his signature work, Reasonable Faith, and he's written over 100 articles which have appeared in professional journals of philosophy and theology. Dr. Craig, welcome. Dr. James Crossley is a lecturer in the Department of Biblical Studies in this university. He did his undergraduate and postgraduate work at the University of Nottingham, and his published work includes a book on the date of Mark's Gospel, a co-edited book on interdisciplinary approaches to history and religion, which is entitled Writing History, Constructive Religion, and he's written articles on the Semitic background to the, uh, to the Gospels, on historiography, on Mark's Gospel, the Resurrection, and the Historical Jesus. He's recently just published a book entitled Why Christianity Happened, a socio-historical account of Christian origins, 26 to 50 CE. And he's also the co-chair of the Jesus Seminar for the British New Testament Society. Those are our two debaters. In biblical terms, it occurred to me to think, are we looking at a battle of David and Goliath? <laughs> the experienced professor and the young upstart. However, <laughs> Professor, <laughs> professor Craig may uh, well remember the outcome of that and not be <laughs> thankful for the analogy. So to balance things, as in a good d debate, it may be that we are more looking at Joab and Absalom the battle-scarred veteran dispatching the glamorous, but perhaps ultimately frivolous, young pretender. <laughs> Let's see what we're going to get, and I invite you both to listen, attend, and enjoy this debate. Well, good evening. I want to begin by thanking UCCF for inviting me to participate in this evening's debate on the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And I also want to say that it's really a privilege to be sharing the podium with Dr. Crossley this evening. 
The question before us tonight is, was Jesus bodily raised from the dead? Now, presumably, our respective tasks in this debate is not just to answer yes or no to this question, but to explain why we would answer yes or no. So in my opening speech, I'm going to lay out some reasons why I answer yes to this question. And I presume that Dr. Crossley will lay out his reasons for saying no. There are at least two avenues to a knowledge of Jesus' resurrection, the existential and the historical. Tonight, I want to focus on the historical case for Jesus' resurrection. I realize that the vast majority of Christians have not based their belief in Jesus' resurrection on historical considerations, but on a personal encounter with the living Lord himself. And I think that this existential approach is entirely legitimate. But I also think that a good historical case can be made for Jesus' resurrection as well. So in tonight's debate, I propose to defend two basic contentions. Number one, there are four historical facts which must be explained by any adequate historical hypothesis, namely Jesus' burial, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. And number two, the best explanation of these facts is that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. Let's look at that first contention together. I want to share four facts that are widely accepted by the large majority of New Testament historians. Fact number one, after his crucifixion, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. Scholars have established the fact of Jesus' entombment on the basis of evidence such as the following. One, Jesus' burial is multiply attested in early independent sources. We have four biographies of Jesus by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which have been collected into the New Testament, along with various letters of the Apostle Paul. Now, the burial account is part of Mark's source material for the story of Jesus' passion. This is a very early source, which is probably based on eyewitness testimony and which the commentator Rudolf Pesch dates to within seven years of Jesus' crucifixion. In fact, Dr. Crossley has himself argued in his book, The Date of Mark's Gospel, that the Gospel of Mark as a whole was written within a few years of Jesus' crucifixion. Moreover, Paul, in his first letter to the church of Corinth, also cites an extremely early source for Jesus' burial which most scholars date to within a few years or even months of his crucifixion. Independent testimony to Jesus' burial by Joseph is also found in the sources behind Matthew and Luke and the Gospel of John. Thus, we have the remarkable number of at least five independent sources for Jesus' burial, some of which are extraordinarily early. Number two, as a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin that condemned Jesus, um, Joseph of Arimathea is unlikely to be a Christian invention. There was an understandable hostility in the early church toward the Jewish leaders. In Christian eyes, they had engineered a judicial murder of Jesus. And thus, according to the late New Testament scholar Raymond Brown, Jesus' burial by Joseph is very probable since it is almost inexplicable why Christians would make up a story about a Jewish Sanhedrist who does what is right by Jesus. For these and other reasons, most New Testament critics concur that Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. And based on his published work, I think that Dr. Crossley would count himself among them. After all, according to the late New Testament scholar John A.T. Robinson of Cambridge University, the burial of Jesus in the tomb is one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. Fact number two, on the Sunday after the crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. The wide majority of scholars also concur with this fact. Here, Dr. Crossley finds himself among that minority of scholars who deny the fact of the empty tomb. 
Now, those who deny the empty tomb almost always try to explain the empty tomb story as a late developing legend which arose long after the eyewitnesses had passed off the scene. But given Dr. Crossley's early dating of the Gospel of Mark, that option is not open to him. Therefore, he has to regard the empty tomb story as a deliberate fabrication on Mark's part, an example of creative Jewish storytelling. Now, I can't think of any other scholar who believes that this hypothesis accurately describes the literary genre of the Gospel of Mark. Mark is an instance of ancient biography, not creative Jewish storytelling. Nor is it easy to understand how people with it, living within a few years after Jesus' crucifixion would be so foolish as to believe in and be willing to die for a creative fiction. But let all that pass. The more important point is that the reasons which have convinced most scholars of the historicity of Jesus' empty tomb also go to refute the hypothesis of creative fiction. Number one, the historical reliability of the burial story supports the empty tomb. If the burial account is accurate, then the site of Jesus' grave was known in Jerusalem to Jew and Christian alike. In that case, it is a very short inference to the historicity of the empty tomb. For if Jesus had not risen and the site were known, number one, the disciples could never have believed in the resurrection of Jesus. For a first century Jew, the idea that a man might be raised from the dead while his body remained in the tomb would have been a contradiction in terms. Second, even if the disciples had believed in the resurrection of Jesus, it's doubtful they would have generated any following. So long as a corpse lay interred in the tomb, a Christian movement in Jerusalem, founded on belief in the resurrection of Jesus, would have been an impossible folly. And thirdly, the Jewish authorities would have exposed the whole affair. The quickest and surest answer to the proclamation of Jesus' resurrection would have been simply to point to his grave, or if necessary, even to exhume the body. For these reasons, the accuracy of the burial story supports the historicity of the empty tomb. Number two, the empty tomb is multiply attested by independent early sources. Mark's passion source did not end with Jesus' burial, but with the story of the empty tomb, which is tied to the burial account verbally and grammatically. Moreover, Matthew and John have independent sources about the empty tomb. It's also mentioned in the early sermons preserved in the Acts of the Apostles, and it's implied by the very old tradition handed on by Paul in his first letter to the Corinthian church. Thus we have again multiple, early, independent attestation of the fact of the empty tomb. This shows that the empty tomb narrative was not a fiction created by Mark. Three, the tomb was discovered empty by women. In patriarchal Jewish society, the testimony of women was not highly regarded. In fact, the Jewish historian Josephus says that women weren't even permitted to serve as witnesses in a Jewish court of law. Now, in light of this fact, how remarkable it is that it is women who are the discoverers of Jesus' empty tomb. Any creative fictional account would certainly have made male disciples like Peter and John discover the empty tomb. The fact that it is women rather than men who are the chief witnesses to the empty tomb is best explained by the fact that they were the discoverers of the empty tomb and the gospel writers faithfully record what for them was an awkward and embarrassing fact. Four, the story is simple and lacks theological embellishment. Mark's empty tomb story is uncolored by the theological and apologetical motifs that would be characteristic of a Christian creation. For example, it is remarkable that in Mark's account, the resurrection of Jesus is not actually described at all. Contrast later forged gospels in which Jesus is seen by a multitude of witnesses emerging from the tomb in glory. In Mark's account, 
There is no proof from prophecy cited, no mention of Jesus' descent into hell, no heralding of a new eon, no description of or reflection on the resurrection body, not even any use of glorious titles for Christ. The story has the earmarks of a very primitive tradition which is free of theological and apologetical reflection. Number five, the earliest Jewish polemic presupposes the empty tomb. In the 28th chapter of Matthew, we find a Christian attempt to refute the earliest Jewish polemic against the resurrection. What were Jews saying in response to the disciples' proclamation, he is risen from the dead? That his body still lay in the tomb in the hillside? That the disciples were crazy? No, they said the disciples came and stole away his body. Now think about that for a moment. The disciples came and stole away his body. The earliest Jewish response to the proclamation of the resurrection was itself an attempt to explain why the body was missing. Thus, the testimony of the very adversaries of the early Christian movement supports the historicity of the empty tomb. The empty tomb cannot, therefore, be the result of creative Christian fiction. Uh, I could go on, but I think enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist on the resurrection, by far most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Fact number three, on different occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact which is virtually universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars, including Dr. Crossley, for the following reasons. One, Paul's list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances guarantees that such appearances occurred. Paul tells us that Jesus appeared to his chief disciple, Peter, then to the inner circle of disciples known as the Twelve. Then he appeared to a group of 500 disciples at once. Then to his younger brother, James, who up to that time was apparently not a believer. Then to all the apostles. Finally, Paul adds, he appeared also to me at the time when Paul was still a persecutor of the early Jesus movement. Given the early date of Paul's information, as well as his personal acquaintance with the people involved, such appearances cannot be dismissed as unhistorical. Two, the appearance narratives in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of the appearances. For example, the appearance to Peter is attested by Luke and Paul. The appearance to the Twelve is attested by Luke, John, and Paul. The appearance to the women is attested by Matthew and John. The appearance narrative spans such a breadth of independent sources that it cannot be reasonably denied that the earliest disciples did have such experiences. Thus, even the skeptical German New Testament critic Gerald Ludemann concludes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four, the original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation facing the disciples following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead and Jewish messianic expectations had no idea of a Messiah who instead of triumphing over Israel's enemies would be shamefully executed by them as a criminal. Two, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Dr. Crossley concurs with this conclusion in his published work. 
But then the obvious question arises, what caused them to believe such an un-Jewish and outlandish thing? Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar at Emory University muses, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. And N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament historian, concludes, that is why as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. In summary, there are four facts agreed upon by the majority of scholars who have written on the subject. Jesus' burial in a tomb, the discovery of his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. That brings us then to my second main contention. The best explanation of these facts is that Jesus rose bodily from the dead. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, historian C.B. McCullough lists six tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation for given historical facts. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all of these tests. Number one, it has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty, why the disciples saw post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and why the Christian faith came into being. Number two, it has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was gone, why people repeatedly saw Jesus alive, despite his earlier public execution, and so forth. Number three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims, the resurrection serves as the divine confirmation of those radical claims. Number four, it is not ad hoc or contrived. It requires only one additional hypothesis, that God exists. And even that need not be an additional hypothesis if you already believe in God's existence. Five, it is in accord with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, does not in any way conflict with the accepted belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. The Christian accepts that belief as wholeheartedly as he accepts the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And finally, number six, it far outstrips any rival theories in meeting conditions one to five. Down through history, various alternative explanations of the facts have been offered. For example, the conspiracy theory, the apparent death theory, the hallucination theory, and so forth. Such hypotheses have been almost universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. No naturalistic hypothesis has attracted a great number of scholars. Now in his published work, Dr. Crossley has adopted the hallucination hypothesis. For my part, I have in my published work argued that the hallucination hypothesis fails on numerous accounts. It has narrow explanatory scope, weak explanatory power. It is ad hoc in a number of ways, implausible in various respects, and incompatible with certain accepted truths. But for now, I'll simply wait for Dr. Crossley to offer an explanation in defense of his theory before voicing any critique. Let me simply say in passing that if he intends to maintain not just that the hallucination hypothesis is a possible explanation, but the best explanation of the facts, then he needs to show how it meets the six criteria more effectively than the resurrection hypothesis. Otherwise, he will have failed to justify a negative answer to the question before us this evening. On the basis of what I've said, I think we can say with some confidence that a person who believes on historical grounds that Jesus rose bodily from the dead violates no canon of rationality in so doing. Even if the evidence is not sufficient to prove the resurrection of Jesus, it is certainly sufficient to make belief in the historical resurrection reasonable. Today, the rational man can hardly be blamed if he believes that on that first Easter morning, a divine miracle occurred.
Okay, well, thank you, Professor Craig. Um, you've certainly lived up to your reputation as an excellent public speaker. Great choice, UCCF. Bad choice now. Okay. <laughs> when I said I was doing a debate against someone who claims that Jesus really was bodily raised from the dead, my mother, whose views on religion are as sane as anybody's I've ever come across, said quite sensibly, how on earth do you prove a thing like that? Well, that it seems good enough for me, but let's see if I can offer you a wee bit more for your free entry fee. There is a reason why this needs to be discussed in more detail. And the reason is that there have been a couple of recent and prominent arguments, including those of William Lane Craig and the Bishop of Durham N.T. Wright, claiming to come as near as damn it to proving that the bodily resurrection of Jesus really did happen. Not only that, but you can find arguments claiming that the resurrection was a major causal factor in the emergence of Christianity as a new movement or a new religion in its own right. Now, this may not seem so strange, I guess, for the majority of this audience, but it is for me. My interests involve historical approaches to early Judaism and the origins of Christianity. Now, I don't think I'm going too far in suggesting that the idea that a human being being bodily raised from the dead and causing a new religion might be more or less unheard of in the academic study of any other historical period. And I don't think it will be taken seriously if someone tried to make such arguments. Now, the reason why such arguments can be made in New Testament studies and theology is the brute fact that the overwhelming majority of scholars are Christian. Additionally, there are countless perfectly competent New Testament scholars based at theological and Bible colleges, many of which have clear guidelines on what cannot be said. <laughs> E.g., Jesus didn't rise from the dead. You could potentially be sacked for saying such things. Now, this of course does not disprove the bodily resurrection of Jesus, and it does not mean that we should purge the discipline of believers, heaven forbid. What it does show is that it's hardly surprising that a significant amount of scholars believe the issues surrounding the bodily resurrection of Jesus may be historically accurate. Of course you will find many scholars thinking this to be the case. By the same token, if the discipline was full of atheists, agnostics and non-believers, I mean, I guess that hardly anyone would believe these things. Put another way, a group of vegetarians as a whole would probably think meat is a bad thing, or eating it at least. Okay, turkeys do not vote for Christmas. Okay, <laughs> it just isn't a surprise that the majority of scholars believe X, Y, or Z about the resurrection. And I'm a, I'm a bit worried about arguments referring to other scholars at the best of times, but in the historical study of Christian origins, I think we should look uh, more carefully at the evidence itself and not be referring to what the majority of Christian scholars think. I'm not sure how much this really counts for anything, to be fair. Now, back to the idea of not being able to prove the resurrection. Uh, I'm actually going to go one step further and suggest that by the usual judgments of historical research, the resurrection stories would be classed as inventions and certainly should not be used to explain why Christianity happened, to paraphrase the title of a recent book. Now, <laughs> Believe what you want, see if I care, okay? <laughs> I don't want to persuade any of you that it didn't happen in your hearts and all that kind of stuff. I, I really couldn't care less. But only in terms of historical res uh, reconstruction of the bodily resurrection I'm talking about. I think it should be dismissed as a historical event, but I suppose, given the confessional dominance of the discipline, it should be dismissed with arguments. Okay. So here they are. Our earliest and possibly independent sources for the bodily resurrection are, I think, very, very weak witnesses. The earliest and possibly independent sources are Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, and Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. I'll start with Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, written 20-odd years after the death of Jesus, but, as we've seen, contains earlier tradition. And I'll read out from it. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Kephas and to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to someone untimely born, he appeared also to me. It's sometimes argued by evangelical scholars that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised, refers to bodily resurrection. Jesus was very literally raised from the very dead. And you'll be happy to know that not for the first time in my life, I agree with the evangelicals. Woohoo! <laughs> Praise the Lord. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not into that stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> The Greek probably does imply a bodily resurrection, no doubt there. Um, so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that Paul believed that there was a bodily resurrection. But let's look in a little more detail. You'll notice that Paul has what seems to be eyewitness accounts of visions of Jesus, including his own vision of Jesus. In contrast, there is no mention of eyewitnesses to the empty tomb. This is just a general tradition, a confession of belief, that's it. So, there are no eyewitnesses to the empty tomb in Paul's version. So let's look at what we do have with Paul's eyewitness accounts. Well, what we do have is a vision. Paul's vision is well known, road to Damascus, bright light from heaven, Paul falls to the ground, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? You know the story. Okay. Well, in general terms, I don't think that's anything new in the cross-cultural study of religion and society. People have visions in countless cultures, accompanying great lights, uh, pretty common. does not mean, though, that anything supernatural underlies such visions. What's more, it's quite obvious that the culture dictates the content of a vision. So, in Catholic cultures, Someone might see the Virgin Mary, and not Zeus, or someone from the Hindu supernatural world. You know what I mean. Now, in the context of early Judaism, there was the idea of martyrs looking forward to being bodily resurrected. See documents such as 2 Maccabees. It seems clear enough to me, at least, that Jesus saw himself as a martyr, and that he knew he was going to die. And so, this could potentially have been the driving force behind the cultural interpretation of the visions after Jesus' death. In other words, there were visions interpreted as a bodily raised Jesus. That does not imply something supernatural underlying such visions or stories. Now, you may counter that such visions may be more ghostly, Okay, kind of Derek Accor or that man off living TV, Scooby Doo, that kind of thing. Okay, but in the context of early Christianity, there was an overlap in the descriptions between the ghostly and the bodily. As Mark's Gospel says in the story of the walking on water, but when they saw him walking on the late lake, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. Mark 6, verse 49. Okay. So there's the first piece of evidence that hardly supports the historical accuracy of the empty tomb and a bodily raised Jesus. The next is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. Mark 16 is the other key piece of information because, as is, well, I guess, implied so far, it's the earliest Gospel. And dated, of course, to the late 30s, early 40s, if you believe me. And, of course, yes. Right, right. Okay. Matthew and Luke are based in large part on Mark's gospel, and it is possible, possible that John's gospel is based on Mark as well. Even if John's gospel is not based on Mark, I am of the opinion, like many others, that it is hopelessly inaccurate and has virtually nothing to tell us about Jesus' life, never mind his alleged resurrection from the dead. Mark 16 has a story of some women going to the tomb, wondering who would roll away the massive stone so that they could get in. Then they saw that the stone had been rolled away. And a young man, dressed in white, probably an angel, was there and calmly told the women that the man they were looking for, Jesus, had risen, and that the women should go tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of them to Galilee. 
and in Galilee they will see Jesus. The frightened women fled and told no one because they were afraid. That's it. The end. It's a strange ending and there are endings added by later writers but this one was certainly not original to Mark. Some scholars have argued for a lost ending. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But positing a lost ending, then guessing what was in the lost ending does not strike me as a very solid basis for reconstructing the historicity of the empty tomb, or sorry, the resurrection of Jesus. What we are left with is this. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Last verse of Mark. That's all we have and I think this could easily be read as a story invented to explain why no one knew of any details of the empty tomb. In other words, the women told no one out of fear. And that's why, Mark explains, no one knows of the whereabouts of the empty tomb. Whatever. Now our early second source is very suspicious. This source has women telling no one of the resurrection, while the other source... Paul has no eyewitnesses in direct contrast to eyewitnesses to visions. This shows, I think, how very, very fragile arguments in favour of the bodily resurrection are. And again, if this was any other academic discipline, I think this best available evidence would not be taken seriously as sound evidence favouring the bodily resurrection. Now, the other gospel accounts go along the lines of the fantastic and are typical enough, I think, of ancient storytelling. In Jewish traditions, Haggadah was a very common literary practice. Um, actually, contrary to what Professor Craig says, I actually do think that Mark's gospel is a biography. And also, uh, contrary to what Professor Craig uh, said, I'm not the only person who thinks that Haggadah is underlying some of the resurrection narratives. The world's leading expert on Haggadic practice and Christian origins, Roger Ause, is currently working on this in some details and has pointed this stuff out for years. Okay, now, in Jewish tradition, this common literary practice involved inventing stories about characters, biblical characters, heroes, rabbis, holy men, and so on. This practice of creative storytelling is not, as some Christians or some conservative Christians have suggested, to be equated with lying or a lack of morality. People were more than happy to make up stories about other people and events and did so as they saw fit. More generally, this kind of rewriting of history is everywhere in the ancient world. And there is plenty of evidence that the first Christians were immersed in the world of creative storytelling that had minimal grounding in history. Now, statistically speaking, you might think that the telling of fictional stories would have to be part of the Gospels. They do, after all, talk about their own hero, Jesus. And passages you might judge to be creative writing phew, might include, I don't know, stories like miracles, resurrected people, eating with people, walking through walls kind of thing. You might think that they are invented stories. I'll leave that open for now. Okay. In fact, we have one relevant passage, which is, I think, quite obviously a human invention. And this is Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 to 53. And this is what it says. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now... My favourite attempt to avoid the blindingly obvious is by the ultra-conservative Bishop of Durham, N.T. Wright, who says, Some stories are so odd they may just have happened. This may be one of them, but in historical terms there's no way of finding out. Hmm. Words like Elvis, fairies, vampires and zombies certainly spring to mind. And it does make you wonder what kind of critical history is left uh, in light of such comments, and it gives you some insight into the strange nature of the discipline. Now, there are good reasons, other than this being a story about several people rising from the dead, to believe that it didn't happen. It's not found in Mark. 
you'd think that Mark might have recorded such a stunningly spectacular event if it had happened. We'd hardly be ignorant of it. Story is not mentioned elsewhere in the Gospels. Why? Why isn't it mentioned? The story of dead people rising from tombs is not found in the work of the first century Jewish historian Josephus. He knew of countless events in Jerusalem, wrote millions of these things down, and it really would have been bizarre if he admitted this pretty spectacular story if it had happened. Now, think of this in terms of a discussion between Josephus and his scribe. Okay? Well, Josephus, let's include a story about two teachers tearing down the decorations of the temple. We'll have to include the story of the Romans sacking Jerusalem and destroying the temple. Oh, we better include that story about those dead people rising from tombs, hadn't we? Isn't it the most spectacular thing you've ever heard, Josephus? No. no. It's not that good. I think they'll find my witty accounts of the political wranglings in Jerusalem more than stimulating. Um, I mean, come on, this would not be omitted in any historical account if it had happened. The other argument against is that according to Jewish views on bodily resurrection, as outlined by Wright, these dead saints would probably have to be alive today. So, where are they? I don't know. Okay. Stand if you will. Okay. But seriously, a key point is that we have a very good piece of evidence that the first Christians were inventing stories about bodily resurrection. Very good example, I think. And that alone should warn us that the resurrection stories could involve rewriting of history. Now, look at what we find. After Mark emphatically telling us that the women told no one of such things, Matthew has the disciples suddenly being told what happened. That not a little suspicious? Then what do we make um, of other aspects of the gospel tradition? Luke's gospel and John's gospel also have Peter present at the empty tomb. Compare that with Mark. Is it not you know, a little suspicious? Then what do we make of Matthew's gospel ending with a story about the resurrected Jesus talking on a mountain about a mission to non-Jews or Gentiles? Jesus, the historical Jesus, didn't have any concern really for a mission to Gentiles and was only really concerned with Jews. But we know for a fact that the early church had an interest in the mission to Gentiles or non-Jews. And so the obvious conclusion for the historian is that the resurrected Jesus, talking of the Gentile mission, is an invention by the early church. Remember also that in Mark, the angelic man tells the women that Jesus is going ahead to Galilee. In Luke, the appearance in Galilee is virtually eliminated. Luke's Jesus does not return to Galilee, but the angelic kind of epiphany thing refers to what Jesus said in Galilee. It just eliminates the return to Galilee. No surprise then that the resurrection appearances and the resurrected Jesus' ascension to heaven take place around Jerusalem, not Galilee. Again, what is going on here other than creative invention and a clear rewriting of Mark's gospel? John's gospel has all sorts of, uh, well, it has all sorts generally of invention, but in terms of the resurrection stories, plenty of that too there. This passage, for example, Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. That's in John chapter 20. And it occurs only in John's gospel. And there's no way I would say that any other gospel would have omitted something so staggeringly dramatic if such a thing were said. In fact, John's gospel is the only gospel that has anything like the full equation of Jesus and God. And he's making it up. By the standards of conventional historical research, then, I think these stories would be regarded as pieces of creative invention. And I think to argue otherwise would be to abandon a useful historical method, and it gets very close to letting blind faith take over. So in sum, something happened after the death of Jesus. And the closest we get to eyewitness accounts suggests that various people had visionary experiences. If Something like the resurrection stories are from any other religion. Ancient historians, I think, would rightly be judging the resurrection stories for more or less what they are. Fiction. Okay, thank you. Okay.
Now, you'll recall that in my first speech, I said that I would defend two contentions in tonight's debate. First, that there are four established facts about Jesus of Nazareth, which any responsible historical account must explain. The first of those was the burial by Jesus uh, by Joseph of Arimath, uh, of Jesus, by Joseph of Arimathea in the tomb. We saw that this was multiply attested and also passed the criterion called embarrassment. And Dr. Crossley didn't offer any refutation for this. Indeed, in his work, he indicates he believes in the historicity of Jesus' burial in the tomb. But then I argued on the basis of five lines of evidence for the historicity of the discovery of Jesus' empty tomb by a group of his women followers. Here, Dr. Crossley asserts that this is an example of creative Jewish storytelling. Even though they knew it was false, they just made it up on the model of, uh, for example, rabbinical antidotes, where, where one rabbi will say, oh, Rabbi Akiba did this miracle or that, or Rabbi Eleazar said this or that. And I want to suggest that these rabbinical stories are not at all comparable to the gospel accounts. Number one, these rabbinical stories are isolated anecdotes. They are not full-blown biographies. And as Dr. Crossley admitted in his last speech, in dealing with the Gospels, we are talking about a genre of historical writing, namely ancient biography, not anecdotal creative storytelling. Secondly, these rabbinical sources are typically hundreds of years later than the characters that they are about. David Instone Brewer, who is a research fellow in rabbinics in the New Testament, writes, it is significant that the rabbinic miracle stories are consistently recorded much later than the traditions about their legal debates and rulings. That is, a rabbi became famous due to his legal rulings or due to the size of the school he led, and then later, that is a century or two later, a number of stories grew up around him. He says this contrasts hugely with what Crossley believes about the Gospels, namely that the miracle stories of Jesus were among the first things recorded about him and that they weren't added much later. So in that sense, they're completely non-analogous to these uh, rabbinical anecdotes. In fact, the analogy would be the apocryphal Gospels. These did arise several hundred years after Jesus was dead and buried, and these do contain all sorts of creative fictions about Jesus but they are quite different from the canonical Gospels, which were all written within the lifetime of the eyewitnesses during the first generation after the events, indeed within a few years, if Dr. Crossley is correct. Thirdly, these rabbinical stories are crafted as entertainment or illustrations. They are sometimes jokes. They are other times illustrations of uh, points of teaching. They are not written as historical accounts. By contrast, the Gospels purport to be historical accounts of what actually happened to Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Dr. Crossley says, but look at uh, certain things in the Gospels that are clearly fictional and non-historical. And he gives the example of the resurrection of the saints. But as Dale Allison points out in his response to an article by Professor Crossley on this, admitting that there are legendary elements in the Gospels, for example, the resurrection of the saints, does nothing to undermine the remaining testimony of the Gospels to things like the crucifixion of Jesus, the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances. You can't treat the Gospels with so blunt an instrument of that if you're going to do significant historical work. So I gave five lines of evidence to show why, in fact, contemporary scholars, by and large, do not think that these accounts of the empty tomb are creative fiction. The account of the burial supports the empty tomb. No response from Dr. Crossley. It's multiply attested. He agrees that Paul believed in the empty tomb. But notice if Paul believed in it, that means Peter and John, with whom he spoke just three years after the event, also believed in the empty tomb. And the question arises, how could they have believed in the empty tomb if, in fact, uh, there was no such thing as the empty tomb if it was a creative fiction invented by Mark? Uh, but in any case, we have multiple attestation of the empty tomb, so it cannot be simply a creative story that Mark made up. Thirdly, as for the women eyewitnesses, he says, well, this story was invented because no one knew of the empty tomb, and so they made up the story that it, the women didn't tell anybody. I find this hypothesis to be just outlandish. In the first place, the empty tomb story was not unknown. As I showed, it was part of the pre-Mark and Passion story, and it's also implied by Paul's formula. So this was a widespread belief. It wasn't unknown. But secondly, the hypothesis is ridiculous on the face of it. 
Are we to imagine that the women said nothing to anybody for years on end, that they remained permanently silent? Mark knows that the disciples did go to Galilee and saw appearances of Jesus as the angel predicts. So the, the women must have told them what the angel said. What the closing to Mark in verse 8 means is that as the women ran back to where the apostles were staying, they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And then arriving where the apostles were, they told them what they had seen and experienced at the empty tomb. There's uh, no reason to think that a creative story would introduce the witness of women for this key fact, which was worthless in that society. Any possible function that women might have served would have been better served by male disciples whose witness would have been valuable in that patriarchal society. I suggested the story lacks any signs of creative embellishment as a creative uh, Christian account would have, and that the Jewish polemic itself presupposes the emptiness of the tomb, and there was no response to those points. So I think, by and large, we have quite persuasive evidence that the tomb of Jesus was, in fact, found empty. This is not a supernatural fact in and of itself. This is an ordinary historical fact when, which any secular historian can agree to. Thirdly, I suggested there were appearances of Jesus, and here he agrees, he uh, uh, agrees that Paul and the disciples had visions of Jesus, that's right, and that's all that needs to be proved at this point. How we best explain them comes later. Finally, number four, I argue that the original disciples came to believe in Jesus' resurrection, despite every predisposition to the contrary. In particular, no one was to rise from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world, so the disciples uh, had no reason to believe that this person that they had believed in was the Messiah after all and would rise from the dead. Now the question becomes, what is the best explanation for this fact? Dr. Crossley says they had visions, that is to say hallucinations, and on the model of the Maccabean martyrs, they interpreted these visions of Jesus in terms of resurrection from the dead. Let me point out several reasons why the, ex the hallucination hypothesis is inadequate. Number one, it has too narrow explanatory scope. It tries to explain the appearances, but it does absolutely nothing to explain the fact of the empty tomb. This is really the Achilles heel of this hypothesis. But secondly, it also cannot explain the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. You see, what the Maccabean martyrs believed in was the resurrection at the end of the world, the resurrection of all the just in which they would share. And if the disciples saw visions of Jesus, they would have believed God had exalted into heaven, and they would have preserved his tomb as a shrine where his bones could reside until the resurrection at the end of the world when they and all the righteous dead of Israel would be reunited in the kingdom of God. As James D.G. Dunn has written, it remains an indisputable fact that the earliest believers were absolutely convinced that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. And yet, why did they conclude that it was Jesus risen from the dead? Why not simply a vision of the dead man? Why not visions fleshed out with the apparatus of apocalyptic expectation coming on the clouds of glory and the like? Why draw the astonishing conclusion that the resurrection had already taken place in the case of a single individual within history. Thus, on the model of Jewish thought forms and thinking, if they had hallucinated visions of Jesus, they would not have hallucinated him risen from the dead. They would have hallucinated him in glory, and that would not have led to the belief in the resurrection. And thus, the hypothesis has inadequate explanatory scope. It cannot explain all of the four facts that I laid out this evening. But secondly, even its explanation of the appearances, which it tries to explain is inadequate, it doesn't have sufficient explanatory power. Suppose that uh, Peter and the early disciples did have hallucinations of Jesus. Would that go to explain uh, their uh, belief in uh, Jesus' resurrection? Well, I think not. The diversity of the appearances cannot be explained well by the hallucination hypothesis. You see, Jesus appeared not just one time, but many times. Not just to one individual, but to many individuals. Not just to individuals, but to groups of people. Not at one circumstance and locale, but at many. Not just to believers, but to skeptics, unbelievers, and even enemies. For example, James, Jesus' younger brother, who was not a believer in Jesus during his lifetime, 
to 500 people at one time, most of whom were still alive in AD 55 when Paul wrote and could be interviewed and questioned, to women uh, who were, whose witness was worthless at that time and so no one would invent a, an appearance to women, to Paul who was a Pharisee and a persecutor of the early Christian church and was independent of the disciples. The hallucination hypothesis cannot be stretched to accommodate this kind of diversity. It, it, these appearances break the bounds of anything found in the casebook of modern psychology with respect to visionary appearances or hallucinations. And therefore, I think it cannot even explain these very well. Well, in addition to this, I would want to argue that it's implausible, it's ad hoc in certain ways, but I, I'm running out of time, so let me simply address Dr. Crossy's last point, that the resurrection hypothesis would not be taken seriously by scholars in other fields. It's because people are already Christians that they believe this. Two responses. Number one, that is ad hominem. That is attacking people, not the arguments they give. And you cannot disqualify a position simply because a person is a Christian. You have to deal with the arguments. Number two, you should contrast contemporary New Testament studies with 19th and 20th century uh, New Testament studies, which were predominantly skeptical about these facts up until around the 1960s. The recent and most uh, advances of New Testament scholars has come back to appreciating the historicity of these facts and of these accounts in contrast to the skepticism in past generations. The reason Dr. Crossley doesn't believe in these events I think is very evident. It's because he's a naturalist. He doesn't believe in miracles. But that is a philosophical question about the existence of God, which someone who is trained in historical studies or New Testament studies is ill-equipped to address. As a philosopher, I think there are good reasons to believe in the existence of God. And so I have no difficulty in accepting a miraculous explanation like the resurrection, which I think far outstrips the hallucination hypothesis in terms of its scope, power, plausibility, and so forth. And therefore, I think it is the better explanation of the facts. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, one of the reasons why I didn't respond to some of them because I didn't want my thunder to be stolen in my main paper, so I'll do it now. Okay. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, was he buried, was he, did he bury Jesus and all that? Well, you know, yes. Um, I could be persuaded of that quite easily, I guess. Uh, maybe he had concerns about corpse impurity or something. Maybe he wanted to bury a good Jewish teacher. No problem there. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe it's very accurate historical tradition. Um, though, for every scholar saying it is, there are plenty who do not. Um, my problem is, is that um, even if the Joseph of Arimathea story is true, we don't have anything else really to go on after that. Uh, we have no specifics of the burial. We're not told where it was really or anything like that. We don't know what happened to Joseph in the years immediately following, apart from like, various legendary traditions. And if all this stuff about the bodily resurrection was true, why weren't the Jewish Sanhedrin converted to it? It would have been blind. Obviously, Joseph will come and see. I'll show you. And they go, oh, right. right, right. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's, um, that tells us too much. Um, let's see. Uh, Jews not expecting the idea of a suffering Messiah. We'll try that one. Okay. Um, but I think there is a strong case, as I said, that um, Jesus knew he would die. John the Baptist had been killed. Jesus must have been aware he was risking his life by doing something dramatic in the temple. So this changes everything. Jesus now um, no doubt deems himself to be a big figure in Jewish history by his followers and no doubt by himself, but he thought he was going to die. What does that? That changes things dramatically. Uh, and so you can't just appeal to uh, you know, the idea of a non-suffering Messiah. You've got a historically uh, new situation on your hands and how do you interpret it? Then maybe you could go back to scripture or your tradition like two Maccabees or something like this and maybe explain why. Um, again, there is still a strong overlap between what was considered ghostly and bodily. So it allows the possibility of interpreting hallucinations, as Professor Craig put it, or visions uh, in a way that could be deemed a bodily figure. So once you've got the idea of a bodily figure interpreted in your vision, well, of course there's going to be an empty tomb from that perspective. It just naturally follows. 
if you interpret the vision as a bodily resurrected figure. So therefore, everybody would have believed there was an empty tomb. Peter, a lot of them, if, they, if they've interpreted this as a bodily figure. Okay, uh, another big argument given was on the women. Now, women were given a relatively prominent role, it seems, in Jesus' ministry. And this, at least, could have made the testimony more acceptable for some. This is what Mark says at the crucifixion. There are also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary and the mother of James, the, uh, the younger, and Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee, and there were many other women who had come up with him from Jerusalem. That's Mark chapter 15, verses 40 to 41. Now, we'll come to that in a second. But also, given the social economic upheaval, which has been well documented in Galilee at the time of Jesus, was, as many kind of cross-cultural theorists of uh, gender studies and uh, kind of millenarian thought have pointed out, these kind of upheavals can lead to shifts in gender relations, at least in the rhetoric. Um, we even have one Jewish revolutionary at the time of the Jewish revolt with a big sort of female following. Now, some socially advantaged women did have a relatively prominent role in the emergence of Christianity, as an opponent of Christianity also noted. Consequently, the women at the tomb, who were said to be capable of supporting the Jesus movement, may well have been culturally acceptable for Christians to use as witnesses, or to give uh, them a prominent narrative role in the story. As ever, we do not have to say that the role of women therefore goes on to imply supernatural explanations for an empty tomb or whatever. Also, Jews could and did write stories of women like Esther and Judith, who played a much more prominent role than some might expect in certain contexts. So why couldn't Christians do the same? Let's try another explanation of the women. After Jesus' arrest, uh, clearly as a political threat from the perspective of the Romans, Jesus' male disciples scatter off out of fear. This is per perfectly understandable. Uh, the first thing the Romans could have done, at least, is kill them all. So it's quite believable that when Jesus gets led away to, um, with a couple of bandits with a big Roman cohort, there'll be no male disciples around. At the same time, it's quite believable that you've got a supportive group of female disciples around. Hence, Mark says the women watch at a distance. Now, think what Mark has left. He has a story where the men had fled, but the women remained. The narrative effectively <coughs> requires the women to be the first witnesses in that context. So again, we have what I think is a perfectly you know, reasonable explanation that could explain that someone somewhere in earliest Christianity could use uh, women to do things of high importance in the narrative, which do not require us to think there's something supernatural underlying all this. But then, think of Mark's narrative, okay? You have a man dressed in white, presumably an angel, there at the empty tomb story. That may have been all the authority Mark needed. You've got an angel at the tomb. That's the first witness, really, to the empty tomb and not the women. Okay, what else? Um, on some of the criticisms at the end, uh, about when I criticise uh, the role of Christian scholars, I was actually uh, saying that we shouldn't be resorting to arguments uh, re referring to other scholars. Because it's a dominant Christian discipline, it's going to be no surprise that lots of people think that this happened. I'm referring to these kind of arguments where this is what scholars believe. Not a big surprise, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that because it's a Christian discipline the arguments are wrong. I'm saying that these arguments are no surprise. So let's just look more at the evidence. Um, as for 20th century scholarship being particularly sceptical, well, there, there's a very good reason for this. Uh, form criticism emerges right at the time of fascism and uh, the idea of uh, a Jewish Jesus being culturally acceptable is a real problem. We, we know now, well-known fact now in New Testament scholarship, that you have Nazi Jesuses. Um, and in this context, the idea of foreign criticism where the early church's meaning is more important is perfectly understandable. It prevents a Jewish Jesus from emerging. And it took a long time for uh, New Testament studies to recover from this. And there has been a huge evangelical turn in New Testament scholarship in the past, um, that's at least 10 years, anyway. So... Um, I don't, again, that's why I would say that referring to the majority of exegetes isn't a very strong argument in itself. As for being a naturalist, well, I don't know, and I just don't care, quite honestly. Um, 
really, I'm just pushing to where the evidence is going to take us on this. And I just do not think we end up having to resort to the supernatural. Okay, on um, genre. Genre. Um, as for creative storytelling, well, this, this, this crosses all sorts of genres. I mean, you can find it in history writings, you find it in biography, you find it all over the place. It's not the genre in itself. People use this kind of writing. I mean, it's very, very common. Um, there are also ra uh, various rabbis who were written relatively close to the death about uh, spectacular things. They're not always jokes. We've got some very serious stories about rabbis. We've also got stuff written about Roman emperors during the lifetime. People thought that they were pretty dramatic figures, uh, would invent legends about them. No problem. People do it. Now, on me, just, I didn't really just refer to these being legendary accounts either of the Gospels. What I did say was we've got this very strong tradition of storytelling, and then I gave arguments on why the stories could be secondary. I argued that there was a case for inventing the story of the empty tomb, for example, that nobody really knew where the tomb was. That's why Mark has to invent a story. And how could they believe this? Well, you've got visions interpreted as a bodily resurrection. Again, I say, therefore it assumes an empty tomb. Okay. Um, any other points? Did I miss anything? Fine, fine way. Uh, no? Okay, well, I'm happy to give up there, but if, you, if I've missed anything there, just let me know. I'll answer. Let's look again at those four facts that I think are best explained by the hypothesis of Jesus' resurrection. First, the burial of Jesus' corpse by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. Here Dr. Crossley says, well, yeah, maybe this is historical, but it doesn't give us many specifics. I'm not interested in the specifics. What I'm interested in is that core of the historical narrative, which is that Jesus' corpse was given an honorable burial by Joseph of Arimathea in a tomb. And the significance of that is that the site of Jesus' tomb in Jerusalem was known to Jew and Christian alike. And as I then argue later, given that fact, it becomes impossible for a movement founded on the belief in the dead man to arise and flourish in Jerusalem in the face of a grave containing his corpse. Dr. Crossley says, uh, with respect to the empty tomb, well, creative storytelling was common in uh, Judaism. Of course it was. There were many types of creative storytelling in Judaism. There were principally three types. There was the creative retelling of Old Testament stories, um, uh, midrash and so forth. Secondly, there were also independent uh, historical romances, novels such as Joseph, Joseph and Asenath, for example. And then there were also these rabbinic stories of miracles, anecdotes uh, in the lives of the great rabbis of the distant past. And the point that I made is that none of these captures the literary genre of the Gospels, which are closest to the genre of ancient biography and which therefore have a significant historical interest. You can't write them off as creative fiction. But in particular, remember, I gave five arguments to show that these are not creative fictions. First, the burial story supports the, tomb of, uh, the empty tomb of Jesus, as I just explained. Secondly, the empty tomb is multiply and independently attested. This is key to the historicity of the narrative, because if there are multiple independent stories about the empty tomb, you can't write it off as a creative fiction invented by Mark alone. So that is a, a, a very powerful point for the historicity of the events. Uh, he says, with respect to Peter and Paul's belief in, or in John's belief in the uh, empty tomb, he says, of course they believed it. But then the question is, again, how could these people in Jerusalem believe in this if it were not in fact the case, given that they were there at the time? I, I, I fail to understand this, and I, I need an answer to it. Thirdly, the women witnesses. Here he has a great deal to say. He offers a plethora of, of mutually incompatible hypotheses. He says, well, the women were given prominent roles in Jesus' ministry, granted. But nevertheless, in a patriarchal culture, their witness was not well received or respected. Any conceivable role 
or reason that might be given for having women witnesses would be better served by having male witnesses. He says, well, the disciples had fled the scene, and that's why the women could not be used, or had to be used as witnesses. There are two responses to that. Number one, it is false that the disciples had fled the scene. That is itself a fiction invented by the critics. The uh, denial of Peter tradition, which I think he would acknowledge as historical, clearly shows that the disciples were still in Jerusalem at that time. They hadn't fled the scene. So they could be used as witnesses if Mark wanted to. But secondly, fiction doesn't know any limits like this sort. As Dale Allison says in his critique of Dr. Crossley's view, it is the hallmark of legends to sin against established facts. Why should Mark be more conscientious? Why not bring Peter and other more important male disciples on stage despite what really happened? Crossley, after all, argues at length that fiction often trumps fact. So if this is a creative fiction, it doesn't matter that the disciples fled, just invent them there on the scene anyway. Then he says, well, maybe the angel gives the authority to the tomb tradition. You don't need the women. Contrary to this, I would say that the angel serves the literary function in the story as interpreting the emptiness of the tomb. The empty tomb is ambiguous in itself and doesn't lead to faith. The angel serves the role of interpreting it. He is not here. He is risen. But the angel is not like a witness who could later be questioned by interested inquirers. Males, rather than women, would serve that role much better. And therefore, it still remains inexplicable why women would be invented to serve this role. So that's why the majority of scholars think, in fact, that Jesus' tomb was found empty by women. Uh, I pointed out that the story lacks legendary or creative embellishment that we would expect in a creative fiction, and that the Jewish polemic, the very enemies of the early Christian movement, attested the emptiness of the tomb. So we've got good grounds for believing in the empty tomb, and that, you remember, will be the Achilles heel of the hallucination hypothesis, because the hallucination hypothesis can't explain that fact. We both agree that the disciples had appearances of Jesus. We both agree that the Christian faith suddenly originated. He says, well, but Jesus had predicted his death. Granted, but that would at best lead them to think that he could be a Jewish martyr along the lines of the Maccabean martyrs. It wouldn't explain how he could still be Messiah, and especially the un-Jewish and outlandish idea that he was already risen from the dead. Now, what is the best explanation of these facts, which are broadly agreed upon by uh, scholars today? And by the way, not just Christian scholars. I would point out people like Geza Vermesh, uh, Pincus Lapid, and other Jewish scholars also accept these facts of the emptiness of, of Jesus' tomb. These are not just property of conservative Christian scholars. Now, what is the best explanation? Well, I gave several arguments against the visionary hypothesis. It has narrow explanatory scope. It can't explain the empty tomb. And especially, and this is so critical, it can't explain the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. Given their Jewish thought forms, if they were to hallucinate visions of Jesus, they would see him exalted in glory, and that would at best live, uh, lead to the view that Jesus now was in Abraham's bosom or at God's right hand. It would not lead to belief in his physical bodily resurrection from the dead. Secondly, I suggested the theory has weak explanatory power because it cannot explain the diversity of the resurrection appearances. It breaks the bounds of anything in the case books of modern psychology about, um, uh, uh, about uh, visions or hallucinations. So given those arguments against the hallucination hypothesis, as well as others that I might give, the only argument against the resurrection hypothesis would be a philosophical argument for naturalism, namely that miracles don't happen. But Dr. Crossley says in his last speech, I don't know if naturalism is true, and I don't care if it's true. Well, fine. Then I would say you need to be open to the explanation that the earliest witnesses themselves gave, namely that God raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Why not believe such a thing? Given the facts, why not think that the God of Israel, revealed and preached by Jesus of Nazareth, has vindicated the radical personal claims for which Jesus was crucified by raising his son from the dead? I can't see any reason apart from an arbitrary presupposition of naturalism for thinking that that hypothesis is not as plausible as the hallucination hypothesis, which faces all of the problems and more that I laid out in my speeches tonight.
Okay, okay. Um, well, I, I'm open to plenty of explanations, but uh, the reason I don't believe is because so many of these kind of explanations are made uh, in a variety of contexts. Various religious traditions make all these claims, and plenty can be rejected for fairly conventional historical reasons, and are rejected for fairly conventional historical reasons. We will come back to that in a moment. Um, genre, again, I think in misunderstanding what I'm saying, uh, the genre of history, the genre of biography writing, the genre of whatever, can incorporate, and almost always does incorporate, legendary storytelling. And it's very, very common. It doesn't matter if it's Jewish, it doesn't matter if it's Roman, it doesn't matter if it's Greek. Very, very common. And this includes biographies like the Gospels. And plenty of ancient biographies include invented stories, and everybody accepts that when it were course, in non-Christian traditions. As for the multiple attestation, well, maybe. I'll, uh, let's just say it is true. I'm not convinced that they are not just creative storytelling by the Gospel writers after they found what the end of Mark is. All you've got is multiply attested tradition. Okay? That takes you back to a belief in a bodily raised Jesus. Well, most of the Christ earliest Christians did believe that. So multiple attestation doesn't really get us very far. It just takes you back <coughs> to the belief. Uh, there's been some interesting studies done on this in com uh, uh, comparing it with various visionary experiences around the First World War. We've got multiple millions of different independent traditions, but nobody thought that it's, uh, really that ghosts were at the heart of it or anything supernatural. It just takes you back to belief. If you're going to use multiple attestation of sources, any second years are here now, they should know this. You should combine it with other methods, various other ones. Is it plausible, blah, blah, blah. But multiple attestations, stressing it and stressing it and stressing it, gets you nowhere. It just tells you that lots of people believe this before the Gospels are written. That's all. Um, Peter and Paul's belief, how did it become uh, so if it was not the case of the empty tomb and so on? Well, again, all they have to do is interpret these visions as a bodily raised figure. That's all they have to do. And then the, uh, the assumption of the empty tomb is there. It, no, there's no story about the empty tomb or anything. Why didn't they go back and see the empty tomb and prove it for everyone to see? Why not do it that? Turn it on its head. Why didn't they all? Because oh, look, he must have risen. What are you on about? You know, well, you know, there's no evidence for that. Um, on the role of women, uh, prominent roles, about culturally different and all that. Well, some of my arguments weren't addressed, I didn't think. E.g., Judy. Esther, these women get prominent narrative roles. None of the socio-economic circumstances were addressed, where we know uh, that, that, that rhetorically at least, and in sometimes in actuality, various roles among the genders can change. Why did Mark bring in various figures? Well, one of Mark's main objectives may have been to explain why no one knew where the empty tomb was, if you've interpreted the vision as a bodily raised figure. The whole key thing of Mark 1 to 8 would therefore be to explain, well, this is the reason why we don't know the women fled, told no one out of fear, and so on. I'm still not sure that dismissing the angel like that uh, gets rid of the idea that the angel is the big authority for Mark anyway. And as for the role of the men, the disciples fleeing, well, we don't know where they fled to. They could still flee in the environs of Jerusalem. Just that they could have hid. That was only a plausible explanation. I'm not saying I think it's necessarily true. I'm just saying you could explain it that way. Why do you have to resort to the supernatural when that is at least plausible? You don't. There's a great Sherlock Holmes thing, you see. Just because loads of people have written and talked about dragons and fairies and things like that doesn't mean to say they all exist. Um, as for embellishments, or lack of them in the empty tomb story, well, I would think that an angel is an embellishment. I would also think that the possibility of a stone being rolled away could be classed as an embellishment. Uh, the implication that a man had been raised from the dead could be classed as an embellishment. I'm not saying they are, but these are things that would be classed as storytelling in any other historical context. So, I mean, I don't think you can get away that easily saying there's no real embellishment. As compared to what? What are you comparing it with? You'd need something before to say if there's been any embellishment done, really. Well, there's nothing really there before to compare it. I mean, there might have been absolutely no such to say that Jesus died. The rest of it could be a complete embellishment in that case. We, I mean, you can, you can explain this in a number of different ways, I think. Um, as for the visions and multiple visions, I'm not sure if they're, that they're unparalleled. I mean, I've read various things in uh, anthropology and things about people having multiple visions together. I think Dale Allison even talked in his latest book of the possibility of multiple visions and appearing to different people. As for um, if, if everything was the case, that Jesus would have been seen as an exalted kind of figure, not as a bodily raised figure, 
No, I think once you've got a, a different situation where someone's predicted their death, it changes things dramatically. What do you do? Well, maybe you can go back to the Maccabean tradition and reinterpret. Maybe you can, but there's one possible explanation. We can't say, well, it, you know, they might have done this otherwise, therefore it's the supernatural. I just don't think that works as, a, as an argument. Also, remember, people did see things in an overlapping sense. People could think that things were... Well, they could see a ghost, but is it a man? Is it a ghost? Is it a person? I don't know. I mean, this is what happens with Jesus walking on water. The disciples think they've seen a ghost, but in Mark's narrative context, they think it's, a, uh, it's clearly a human figure. It's Jesus. So you can confuse the two categories quite easily, I think. Um, I think I'll end there. I think that's probably responded to most of the main points. In my closing statement, I'd like to draw together some of the threads of this debate and see if we can draw some conclusions from them. First of all, I've argued that there are four facts about the fate of Jesus of Nazareth which we ought to accept and which any historian who deals with Jesus needs to explain. His burial, his empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances to the disciples, and the origin of the Christian faith. Now, I want to clear up a misconception that Dr. Crossley has brought up again and again. He says, I see no reason on the basis of the evidence to appeal to supernatural facts or supernatural explanations. Note that none of these facts are supernatural. These are simple, uh, non-supernatural, non-miraculous facts, that Jesus' body was laid in a tomb, that the tomb was found empty, that there were visions of Jesus, and that the original disciples came to believe in his resurrection. These are facts which any secular historian could accept and that, that they do accept. So this is a red herring when he says, I don't see any reason to believe in supernatural things. That will only come when you get to my second contention, what is the best explanation of these facts? But in terms of a, a, a tomb being found empty, that is not a miraculous fact in and of itself. That is something that is open to historical inquiry. Now, I think we've seen that there are good grounds for believing that Jesus was buried, and then you've got a real problem as to how a belief in his resurrection could arise and flourish in Jerusalem. With respect to the empty tomb, I laid out five lines of evidence for that, and I showed that these are not comparable to rabbinical anecdotal stories. He says, but historical writing has legends in it. I can grant that. But the point is, he's argued that the resurrection accounts are comparable to these anecdotes told by rabbis about one another, creative Jewish stories, and I showed that they're not at all analogous, that these rabbinical stories come hundreds of years later, they're used as sermon illustrations and entertainment, they're not comparable to historical writing. So I think that explodes the idea, or his hypothesis, that these are creative instances of, of Jewish story writing. Um, with respect to the empty tomb, I argued for the historicity of the burial, the multiple attestation. He says the multiple attestation only gets you back to the belief itself. No, what it shows you is that this wasn't made up. If you have multiple independent witnesses to a fact, then you can't say it was just the product of Mark's creative storytelling, which is his hypothesis. He says you've got to combine multiple attestation with other methods. I do. I use the criterion of embarrassment, the criterion of dissimilarity, to show multiple lines of evidence for the empty tomb. With respect to the women, he insists that women were prominent in Judaism, like Judith, for example, but notice that these are the exceptions that prove the rule. Any conceivable role for having women be the witnesses to Jesus' tomb would be better served by men. With respect to the lack of embellishment, he says, well, the angel is an embellishment. Well, I'll, I'll grant him the point for the sake of argument. But all of those other elements listed uh, do not appear, for example, describing Jesus rising from the dead. He says, well, compared to what is this account primitive? Compared to the apocryphal gospels, like the gospel of Peter, where Jesus comes out of the tomb uh, supported by two angels with their heads reaching up to the clouds and his head beyond the clouds. And then a cross follows them out of the tomb. And a voice says from heaven, hast thou preached to them that sleep? And the cross answers, yay. Well, these are how real legends and creative stories look. By contrast, the Gospels are stark in their simplicity. He's never answered the point about the Jewish polemic itself being uh, a pre presupposing the empty tomb. So I think we've got good grounds for all four of those facts. 
Finally, is then the best explanation of these facts hallucinations or is it resurrection? With respect to hallucinations, I showed that it has narrow explanatory scope. He says, but they could interpret it as bodily resurrection, not in time and space in history. Bodily resurrection at the end of the world, yes. And Jesus predicted his death, yes, but that would only lead to believe in him as a Jewish martyr who would be raised from the dead at the end of history. And as Dr. Crossley has emphasized, visions and hallucinations are simply projections of the mind and express the thought forms of their percipients. And given their Jewish frame of thinking, they would hallucinate Jesus uh, in heaven, in Abraham's bosom, not literally bodily, physically raised from the dead. So apart from naturalism, I see no good reason to deny the hypothesis of the resurrection of Jesus. Now tonight I focused on the historical angle and approach to the resurrection, but there's also that existential angle. And I think that one can know that Jesus is risen from the dead simply through knowing the living Lord himself. And so through both of these avenues, I think a knowledge of the resurrection is open and is rational to the thinking person today. Thank you, but please reserve your applause to the end. Um, okay. Um, on the supernatural explanation, yes, this is exactly what I'm saying, is that underlying it, you've got to go for this supernatural explanation. I say you do not have to. The empty tomb itself, if, tr if historically accurate, which I don't think is, I gave some arguments on that, why it wasn't, could still be explained in other different ways. You know, has it been, the body been stolen? We know these kinds of things happen. I also said that Mark 16, 1 to 8, explains why no one knew where the empty tomb was. As for creative stories being hundreds of years later, we have some that weren't hundreds of years later. We have some that are written in the lives of individuals as well. We have some in the general Roman world as well. Um, multiple uh, uh, witnesses, if I even think these are independent stories, uh, and being compared to what? I was saying being compared to earlier traditions. It's no good comparing them to later traditions. If you want to see this embellishment, you need to compare it really with earlier. And there is nothing earlier by which we can compare. So we just don't know, in one sense, uh, the extent of any embellishment or not. Um, as for Jewish polemic, you're right, I didn't answer that. Um, there are uh, plenty of parallels to this. You find um, polemic aimed at Jews and the uh, Moses story, the Exodus story. Um, uh, and it assumes that the validity of the Jews coming out from uh, Egypt, but it just says, it's, well, it's due to them being lepers and things like this. They agree that the underlying story is correct, then they go and give a different explanation. Now, um, I want to end by telling myself off a little bit. Okay, people like me, I think, are wasting a lot of energy on showing that the obviously fictitious is, well, obviously fictitious. More broadly, if this energy went into providing more and more conventional historical explanations for Christian origins, we might be able to do something genuinely progressive with a historical study of Christian origins. Now, in The Last Vampire, a TV adaptation of Arthur Conan Doyle's The Sussex Vampire, the late Jeremy Brett as Sherlock Holmes, was reluctant to take up a case supposedly involving vampires because it was all too superstitious for his this-worldly rational mind. With all the allegations levelled at the so-called vampire Stockton, easily explained, Holmes said, in a this-worldly manner. But he took the case nonetheless in order to prevent an innocent man having a stake driven through his heart. Okay. Now, such an analogy with the historical study of Christian origins may seem a wee bit far-fetched, and I would not dream of comparing myself to the great Jeremy Brett. But it seems to me that there may be a regrettable need for people to keep showing that there are perfectly normal explanations for the resurrection in order to prevent the underlying supernatural explanations hindering the more conventional explanations for Christian origins, or if you like, to prevent a stake being driven through the heart of the historical study of Christian origins. Um, in historical terms, anyway, we have seen, at the very least, that evidence for the bodily resurrection hardly demands that it really did happen, with God intervening in history. Among the many things that worry me about Professor Craig's argument is that when he thinks, I think wrongly, to have shown that an unlikely argument explaining the details surrounding the bodily resurrection has occurred, he effectively has to say that as that is unlikely, then let's really go to the supernatural. There are loads of different ways of explaining these, uh, these data. So instead, 
of finding a range of possible historical explanations, the divine, something we don't know, something we can't see, just creep in as a somehow superior explanations. And I don't think so. Um, if some of the this-worldly arguments explaining the empty tomb and the resurrection stories are speculative, how speculative are arguments saying, oh well, supernatural explains all. Now remember Sherlock Holmes okay, and Jeremy Brett. He was involved in a case where the local villagers think that all the evidence points towards Stockton being a real vampire from the old St. Clair family of vampires. And there's even the unusual instance of Sherlock Holmes having a vision or hallucination. But thankfully our hero doesn't give in to supernatural explanations. Uh, and he is sure and he's vindicated that there is a rational, this worldly explanation for all. All is explained even when everyone else thought otherwise. Most entertainingly, Sherlock Holmes suggests to the local vicar that the reason why got, the word got round about all these strange stories of the supernatural is because of the church, the fount of all gossip. Now, whose example do you really want to follow? Do you want to follow the supreme rationalist or the villagers believing in vampires without seriously trying to seek alternative explanations? I mean, I'm teasing a little bit, but the kinds of issues here have wider implications for the historical study of Christian origins. What a debate over the historical accuracy of uh, the empty, where the empty tomb often boils down to and the resurrection are two different approaches to history that are close to being irreconcilable. To give us a contemporary slant, do we want to find whatever naturalistic causes are possible in historical explanation, leaving questions of the divine to, uh, completely to one side, or do we want to take the pseudo-scientific route of intelligent design and creationism and say that supernatural can be shown to be directly intervening in history? Take your pick. Well, first, um, thank you to our two debaters who have striven mightily and given us a great deal to chew over and to ponder on. So, can I ask you first a question, I think, to Professor Craig, um, who would like to kick off? There's someone in the middle over there in the brownish shirt. We have to wait for the microphones to come. Oh, hi. Um, the Matthew 27 account seems to be problematic to you. You made the point you don't have to believe it to believe the resurrection. So I want to ask, do you believe it? Why do you believe it? And what happens to the dead people, um, as Mr. Crossley suggested, and the lack of Josephus evidence? Right. Well? I don't know what to think about this uh, passage. Actually, I think that on Dr. Crossley's view, he ought to take it as historical, because it's very easy to understand how a community that believed that Jesus of Nazareth was risen from the dead uh, and, and therefore hallucinated visions of him might have a whole chain of hallucinatory experiences of seeing Old Testament saints ri risen from the dead. And that Matthew then reports this fact that uh, people in the city saw these Old Testament saints and uh, they appeared to them. So it would be very easy on his hypothesis to think of this as being uh, an historical account of what people in Jerusalem experienced. I'm not sure what to think. It, um, my, my reservation is that it could be part of the apocalyptic imagery of Matthew, which isn't meant to be taken in a literal way, that uh, this would be part of the typical sort of apocalyptic symbolism to show the earth-shattering nature of the resurrection and that it needn't be taken historically, literally. But the one thing that I want to uh, close with on commenting on this is note that this is not attached to a resurrection narrative. This story about the Old Testament saints is attached to the crucifixion narrative. So that if you try to say that because Matthew has this unhistorical element in his crucifixion account, that therefore the whole account is worthless, you would be led to deny the crucifixion of Jesus, which is one indisputable fact that everyone recognizes about the historical Jesus. So it really doesn't have any implications for the historicity of the burial story, the empty tomb story, or the appearance accounts. It's connected to the crucifixion narrative. Thank you, Professor Craig. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, well, uh, shifting it over to me, I mean, that's 
Um, what is this vision? Well, I doubt it. Nobody else records this story, just Matthew. Um, tying it to the crucifixion is meaningless. I mean, it just, all it shows is that we know people make up stories about resurrection. That's what this story shows, which we know that the first Christians could invent a story about resurrection. And therefore, we might want to see if there are other reasons behind, you know, why they could have invented other stories about resurrection, perhaps. But still, uh, I just, uh, I, I mean, really, uh, it just shows that people can make up these stories and that they were making up stories about bodily resurrection. I mean, that's the key point. Thank you very much. Now, an opportunity to question Dr. Crossley directly. Hi there. Um, a question to Dr. Crossley. Um, just uh, in relation to what Mr. Dr. Craig was saying towards the end, um, do you or, or do you not agree with him that Jesus' death, uh, the empty tomb, and the disciples' belief are not supernatural events, that those things in themselves are not supernatural events? That was what he was arguing, and I didn't hear any, any response to that well, from you. Of course I don't. And why would an empty tomb be a supernatural event? Of course I don't think that. I think that when you start saying you've got these, these, these issues, and then you say that this, this ha you have to go back to... Uh, supernatural underlying cause is what I was saying. Now, I also I did add that uh, if the empty tomb story was historically accurate, if there was the, sorry, if the empty tomb was historically accurate, which I, I, I don't believe, but if it was, well, it can be explained in various other ways. Maybe it was stolen. Maybe it was done this way. Maybe it was done that way. There was, you, why do you have to resort to Jesus being bodily raised from the dead to do that? You could you could potentially explain it in different ways. The fact, fine, it's not a supernatural event in itself, obviously, but underlying, then but they're going from that to supernatural event to, is a problem. Well, I appreciate that uh, admission on Dr. Crossley's part. I think that's extremely important. What that means is that a person, even a non-Christian, can accept my contention one about these four facts and then simply say with respect to contention two, I'm agnostic about what the best explanation of these facts are. And uh, therefore, it is simply not the case that these are accepted as facts because people are Christians or because uh, they believe in the resurrection of Jesus or any such thing, because there are plenty of folks who believe that these four facts belong to our portrait of the historical Jesus, but then they do not take that extra step of saying the best explanation of these is the miraculous explanation. Many of them feel that uh, the, as historians, they can't do that, uh, that historians have to use a kind of methodological naturalism. Um, so I, I think it is important to keep these issues distinct, lest somebody be skeptical about these four facts because they don't believe in miracles. That would be a, a red herring. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Craig's turn to be questioned. Is there someone a question there? Yes. Yes, this is a question about, in your, uh, your part two, you had six criteria from yes. McCulloch, I, I believe it was. Right. One of them was plausible, right. and I wonder how it's, how it's very useful to use that here when the plausibility, maybe the possibility for the sake of argument could be granted, but the plausibility of resurrection. Right. And, and the, one of the others was contrivance. Would you, would you admit that there are, at least for the sake of the argument, there are elements of contrivance, for example, the sealing of the tomb and the posting of a guard in the uh, in the some of the sources. Okay. Now let's be clear again. The notion of being ad hoc or contrived is with respect to the explanation. It is the hypothesis of the resurrection contrived or ad hoc? And McCullough defines being ad hoc in terms of how many extra hypotheses do you have to adopt in order for this one to be true. And as I said, there isn't one extra hypothesis that you have to adopt for the resurrection hypothesis to be true, and that is that God exists. Now, that's a huge hypothesis. But if you already believe in the existence of God, say on other grounds, as I do, then that's not an insurmountable object, uh, obstacle. I think the hallucination hypothesis is ad hoc in quite a number of other ways um, so that the resurrection hypothesis doesn't uh, have a, a great deficiency here in terms of its ad hocness. Now, with respect to plausibility, the reason I mention is because I want to be honest about what McCullough's criteria are. These are the criteria he, he lists, and it may well be the case that the resurrection is very high, say, in explanatory power and explanatory scope, but it might be very weak in terms of plausibility. And the historical craft, the art of the historian, is to assess these criteria, their weaknesses and strengths,
and to see which one best passes them. My argument is, though, that the resurrection isn't really implausible given the historical context of Jesus' own radical claims and life and crucifixion, that it fits in very nicely with his claims to be the harbinger of the kingdom of God, the absolute revelation of God the Father, the unique son of God and son of man revealed to mankind. The resurrection fits in with that context and therefore isn't implausible in that way. And it's not implausible by being miraculous because what is implausible is merely that anybody should rise naturally from the dead. That is implausible, but I don't see any implausibility in saying that, that a miracle has occurred. Um, well, I mean, I would say again, you can give, I could just give you the alternative explanation for it. Maybe there was a vision, they interpreted the vision as a bodily raised figure. There you go, plausible explanation. You've got an empty tomb. Mark explains why the disciple, uh, why no one knew where the empty tomb was. There's another explanation. Which one do you choose? And presumably you could make other explanations. As for, I mean, I would just want to qualify on Jesus' claims. I don't think he said anything that radical uh, in terms of son of God and son of man. Son of man is an ordinary Aramaic term for human being, which can be used with a reference to the individual and a group. As it happens, we do have one of the experts on the son of man problem in the audience who would agree with that, I strongly suspect. Um, son of God can just be interpreted as good Jew. And interestingly, in, the, uh, in, in say, um, Mark, Matthew and Luke, you don't get anything quite like you get in John's gospel when it comes to terms of son of God. Son of God means something like strongly divine and you get Jews throwing stones at Jesus because of it. You don't get that in Mark, for example. Why not? You only get it used in a, in, within the uh, common enough use in Judaism. So terms son of man, son of God were not used that radically by Jesus, I don't think. So I think that undermines that claim a little bit. All right. Next question, I think, is to Dr. Crossley. <coughs> This is a very simple question for Dr. Crossley. Does he believe that Jesus gave the Great Commission, the so-called Great Commission, before or after the so-called resurrection? Um, he just didn't give it. Uh, uh, the Great Commission, I mean, you talk about the end of Matthew's Gospel. Uh, well, Jesus didn't have any mission to Gentiles, really. I mean, he may have some contact with them. He had a uh, mission to Jews and more or less Jews alone. Maybe Gentiles came in and the, when all the kingdom came and all that. So um, I am very, very skeptical that Jesus would have given anything like the Great Commission. Uh, is that what you're on about the end of Matthew? Is that? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So no, absolutely not. I believe in it. Then obviously the rest of the question, before or after the so-called resurrection, is immaterial. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, he just didn't give it. So, I mean, whether he's dead or alive or whatever. You know. Right. Well, no, I think we, we let's hear. Professor what I would Craig. say in response to that is that however Matthew may have uh, worded it in his own theological language, the notion that Jesus did commission the disciples to go out and preach and foresaw a Gentile mission is multiply attested in the Gospels and I think therefore belongs to the portrait of the historical Jesus that uh, we ought to accept on the basis of the evidence. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry we have to be a little ruthless and not allow people too many supplementary questions. Um, now a uh, question to Professor Craig, I believe. I um, just want to ask, how do you um, try and reconcile the differences between um, the accounts in the Gospels of what happens after the resurrection, which I think Professor Crosley touched mm -hmm. upon, and um, uh, also uh, the idea of the resurrection would have also uh, ha would have to have come from Mark, his source, but the traditions between Mark and say two um, two um, Corinthians are different, as in two Corinthians says that uh, Peter, I mean Jesus, uh, appeared to Peter first, and so and. Um, uh, well, Mark says they appeared to the women first. So obviously the traditions aren't harmonious and um, mm -hmm. neither, neither are they within uh, the context of the yeah. Gospels. My argument is based upon the historical core of these narratives and is not in any way undermined by saying that there are divergences in details. Now, in fact, I do think the appearance narratives are completely uh, harmonizable and can be listed in the order in which they occurred. Um, actually, it's in 1 Corinthians that Paul lists the appearances, uh, listing Peter first. 
And it's not in Mark, it's in Matthew that the appearance occurs to the women. Uh, and what I would say is, I think what most New Testament scholars would say, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is not listing the appearances of Jesus, he is listing the principal witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And given that women were worthless as witnesses to historical facts in a patriarchal culture, he simply omits the mention of the women in his list. He begins with Peter, the chief disciple. Um, so I would say that although there is an appearance to women first, it wasn't used in the apostolic preaching, in the apostolic proclamation of the gospel. They would list the, the male witnesses rather than the women witnesses who saw Jesus at the tomb. So I think they are harmonizable, but I don't think that that's all that important, really, uh, because I'm not basing the argument upon any particular uh, details or, or sequence of the appearances. So I, I would say they appeared first in uh, Jerusalem, then in Galilee, and then back in Jerusalem again, as the disciples followed the pattern of Jewish feasts of going to and from Jerusalem. Um, really just briefly, I mean, it is an interesting uh, point. But um, I mean, I, I think it can it can be harmonized if you you want to do that, as uh, Professor Craig said. Uh, and it may be because Paul is you know still in a very patriarchal context, he does want to eliminate this if he knew of this tradition. But I mean, I don't think any of the arguments are ultimately based on 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 this point at all. Although it is a very interesting point, nonetheless. Right. A question to Dr. Crossley. Um, my question is on the reliability of any source material. Um, given your hypothesis that really a lot of it is legendary and myth and, and creative storytelling, can we trust any other material at that time like Josephus? And are there examples of other source material that are so legendary as you claim that the New Testament documents are? I, I actually, um, I don't go that far as saying it's all, I mean, I'm actually quite a fundamentalist at times when it comes to things like Mark's gospel. I mean, I believe quite a lot of it's historically accurate, and some people have told me that I'm a conservative evangelical because of it. Not true. <laughs> Don't get your hopes up. Okay. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, Josephus contains plenty of uh, uh, what we might call legendary or invented material, but he also contains plenty of material we can reconstruct first century or whatever century history with. So uh, I think in, uh, in Mark's gospel and to an extent in Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel, you can reconstruct quite a lot, I think, about historical Jesus. John's gospel, not a chance other than he lived and died. Uh, that's it with John's gospel. But I'm quite, I'm quite open on the synoptics. Thanks, Greg. I think what is novel about Dr. Crossley's view and, and makes it uh, different from others is his claim that certain aspects of the Gospels, though written within 10 years after Jesus' death, uh, that he dates the Gospel of Mark so early as well as Matthew and Luke, that the hypothesis of legend really becomes precluded because uh, the time, the window of opportunity for legendary accrual is, is so narrow. And therefore, he ri writes them off in certain cases as this Jewish creative storytelling on the analogy of Jewish historical romances or rabbinical anecdotes. And as I contemplated this proposal, it occurred to me that most of the arguments that are typically given for the historicity of the burial, the empty tomb, and so forth, already preclude that sort of hypothesis. Um, and that was why I tried to craft my arguments tonight using the traditional criteria of dissimilarity, embarrassment, multiple attestation, and so forth. A question to Professor Craig, then. Professor Craig, I can appreciate that you've separated your arguments into two sections. On the first section of that, um, relying a lot on cultural and uh, literary probability. I um, mean, it's the second, second aspect of that, that bodily resurrection that um, I think I, I would get a little hung up on, especially um, in regards to plausibility. Um, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And of course, the, the claim that someone who's dead, who, who they made sure was really dead, uh, rose from the dead is a, is a pretty extraordinary claim that requires extraordinary evidence. 
And you said that the one hypothesis um, that you need to accept to, to believe that is, is, is believing in God, is a belief in God. But it's not just that, it's a belief in a particular kind of God, uh, a kind of God that would want to have interacted with right. the world in this way. It's not just any God. Um, and it's, it's a Christian God, a, a Ju Judeo-Christian God. Um, and so it brings with it an entire tradition of theological uh, baggage, if you will, with it. So how do, you, how do you respond to that? Well, let me say first of all that this slogan uh, that you have uh, repeated that sounds so commonsensical, so, so uh, reasonable that extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence is actually false, I and it is demonstrably false. Uh, when you look at the probability calculus for how to um, determine whether or not a highly improbable event occurs, it is not true that highly improbable events require highly, highly extraordinary evidence. Uh, probability theorists have shown that even if an event is extraordinarily improbable relative to our background information, nevertheless, if the, the alternatives to it are very, very improbable, then that counterbalances out any sort of intrinsic improbability in it. So that it's actually false that extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence. Um, now, with respect to the resurrection, however, I think you're quite right in saying it's not just any old God that is required, that it does bring with it this, this tradition. And so what I would say is that if, as part of your background information, you have belief in a personal God who is a creator and designer of the universe and the source of moral values, that it is not at all implausible that this God raised Jesus of Nazareth from the dead and is the God of Judaism, in fact. So you're right, that is, that is uh, uh, part of the background belief um, that I would say one would, one would bring to the table. And uh, if you find that uh, impossible or, or unlikely, that will reduce the probability of the resurrection hypothesis, certainly. But I don't find that improbable and therefore in fact, since I find it actually probable that such a being exists, I think that increases the probability of the resurrection hypothesis. Okay. Um, yes, it may be a slogan. It may be a bit over the top, but it is an important point because we do, really, you know, I mean, really, we don't have all the details around this time. We don't have stuff. Uh, what happened to Joseph Ar Arimathea? We don't have the in intricate details from, you know, the year thirty or whatever, and things like this. And we can explain it in a multiple various different ways. They may, may be plausible, may not be so plausible, but they can function as explanations. That's what worries me when people say that, well, it's doubtful, therefore supernatural is the best explanation. I just don't think that's the case. And the other question about the, uh, the uh, theology, Judeo-Christian theology, is it does raise an interesting question about what do we do with claims made by other kind of religious traditions? What do we do with claims made about uh, Roman emperors, for example, people could invent stories in the lifetime of the Roman emperors like that. You can invent it, it doesn't take 10 years to invent a story, you can invent a story like that. Anyone can, and people did. We know this. Uh, they did it about in the lifetime of Alexander or Augustus or whatever, they did this. So what about those claims? They're very early, exceptionally early in fact. Are they true? Well, I guess probably not, but why not? Why not? Why don't we debate those in more detail? Well, unfortunately, that brings us to the witching hour of 9.30. And I know, being mostly a student audience, you're already well past your bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and we have had our money's worth, especially considering it was free, from our two speakers. So I think we owe it to them to allow them to rest their voices and their brains a little. But I'm sure you would like to join me in thanking them very much in bringing a wealth of scholarship, a wealth of rhetorical prowess, and a wealth of ingenious and more or less plausible invention to this a very interesting debate and which will probably leave you with a lot to think about from now on. Uh, thank you very much, both of you.